in Cleveland, where I grew up, one street over from me was my friend Seth Tabachman, and he and I got into comics at a similar time. We, we met in first grade. We went to a comic convention, actually, in 1970, we went to Detroit. His parents drove us to a comic convention, and it just, you know, it, it, something clicked there. And at the end of the summer, he and I decided to do a magazine. So we put together, we interviewed some artists, and we got some stories, and we got some fan art. So if somebody was interested in comics, uh, then we felt like it was our God-given right to be in touch with them. And one of those people, as it turned out, was Harvey Pekar. We went and we buzzed his door and said, um, you know, literally, understand you have comics, can we come up? And he was like, wow, well, okay, okay, come on up, I guess. And he had uh, this huge record collection. He had a few comics. He had some original R. Crumb work. And I had seen R. Crumb's work, but I was still not reading many of the underground comics. And um, through Harvey, incidentally, we ended up getting an interview with Crumb. And I still was like, you know, I understand he's done some things that are interesting. And he was like hugely famous, but I was unaware of this because he didn't draw Spider-Man. The underground comics seemed like they had a lot more to do with my life than the superhero comics did. And in fact, there was a point where I stopped reading comics altogether and I thought, I'm now too old for this. It's time to, time to put this away. And I got Mono, a traditional high school malaise, and, uh, um, and fell into bed. And some of my comic book friends brought me all the comics I had missed from the previous two months when I was just on that line. It was one of those great dividing moments in my life. And while I was in bed, I read comics and I started drawing in my sketchbook. And I, that's I, when I really got rolling also keeping a sketchbook. To put as much energy into a comic, it always seemed like we wanted to do something more with it. And we felt the tension that was going on. Ronald Reagan was heading towards winning the election and there was the hostage crisis in Iran. And it all seemed like here we are poised for what could be like a nuclear exchange. World War III, we're on our 26th, 27th year of publishing it. I'm still editing it um, since art school. No one's ever made any money. We only plowed money into it for years. All the work that goes in there is done for free. We are not captive to much of anything. We're certainly not captive to making a living, but we're also not captive to whether somebody says that it's okay for you to talk about the president in in not glowing terms uh, at a point when everybody's supposed to, you know, shut up and, and go along with Homeland Security. I think a lot of the reason why I draw and do comics is just about communication. I want to say, like, here's my perspective, here's my experience. Do you share it? You know, and, and try to create a dialogue. Even with something like wordless comics, they don't happen until the reader connects the dots picture to picture. I, I'm hoping in general that it's, a, it's very much of an engaging type of approach to, to storytelling. And I was exploring the possibility of using medium and approaches, uh, especially with the system, that were not uh, what people expected comics to be. So they didn't have word balloons. By removing some of those expectations, it had the effect that I had hoped for, and it did reach much more of an adult audience. It, you know, it just seemed odd to me on, a, on another end that, you know, if somebody sees a word balloon, they're going to immediately think, that's for kids. But if I take that away, then they're going to go, hmm, what's this? It's, it looks like art. Well, being interested in an art form that has been so ostracized in a lot of ways or, or regarded as not art and all, it's that outsider experience, which is um, a good way to get a look at what's going on. And feeling like an outsider is a useful means of um, being able to comment on, on what's happening and, and maybe finding some reality, not that it guarantees that by any means, but um, that has been part of the experience of looking at things and trying to uh, make stories about them and examine them and hold it up to the light. It's also interesting to see how society over the years has changed to the point where the things that we were like the nerdy guys interested in are, it's now a social phenomenon of every single movie, virtually, and uh, clearly it wasn't as off-center and the, the, the nerdy guys somehow have gained power or something. <laughs> I, I could have definitely used some of it in, in junior high school, but having said that, better late than never. I found comic books uh, 
in my environment. I, I didn't understand, I was so young, I didn't understand where they were coming from. They usually came from other kids in the neighborhood and all the ones I had lacked covers. And I did eventually find some in a grocery store once. And I picked up a couple copies of Spider-Man there. But the problem with Spider-Man was it was a continued story. And I didn't understand what those little numbers on the cover meant. So, and I credit this with a lot of my ability to imagine stories today. Uh, I kept rearranging the comics and reading them in different orders and imagining the missing information between the story. And I came up with tremendous stories to connect the two comic books I had. Either way. <laughs> At the risk of embarrassing my parents, I uh, was a mediocre student and my parents were convinced that uh, if they took my comic books away, I would improve in school. I, uh, I had one reaction to that, I started drawing my own. <laughs> that was in the fifth grade. The uh, Nucleus book uh, called together a number of other friends and fans that I met for the first time. We all wrote and drew little articles about our favorite comics and did some comic strips. And I met Mark Hempel at that time. And he was in high school and I was just going into college. But he was so good. I mean, his work was amazingly good. It was professional quality. He actually knew what kind of ink pens to use, what kind of brushes to use. And I was self-taught. I was actually inking with those little 15 cent model brushes that you got to paint models with. I learned a lot from him just from that moment of looking at his work and his originals. And uh, yeah, I kind of thought this is a guy I'd like to stay in touch with because he really knows his stuff. There are two ways to create. One is a very commercial way and one is a very personal way. And the very commercial way is you look at the marketplace and you decide what the marketplace wants and you create that and you feed that demand. I've had far more success at pulling my ideas from personal experience, personal motivations and desire, uh, either myself or my teammates that I work with and collaborate with. Uh, Breathtaker came from a very simple initial step, which was Mark needed work. Mark Hempel needed work. And I decided I needed to write a story that would talk or speak to where Mark was at the time. And uh, he was, at the time, very much into the dating market and was trying to find someone to spend his life with. And I knew he was very sensitive to that. And he had been doing a series of rather provocative, sexually oriented paintings. And I took those and looked at those and thought, okay, what does this suggest to me? And then I went off walking in the woods and spun a story in my mind all around a title that had popped up, which was Breathtaker. I essentially made it an analogy for being an outcast and trying to find love. When the book came out, which was probably close to three years after we initially pitched it, everyone said, wow, what a really sensitive AIDS analogy. Because, you know, she's taking the life from people and it's love and all those things. And I thought to myself, wow. AIDS wasn't even on our radar when we pitched this, but I can see it. I can see why it would fit that. But there's no way we could have anticipated it. Reading Harvey Kurtzman, I just believe fervently that comics was a language. It's not a genre. People always think, oh, comics, superheroes. Comics is a language and it's a visual language. It cuts across cultural barriers, it cuts across national barriers, it cuts across language barriers because the language of comics is something that a man in Dubai can understand almost as easily as a man in Chicago. And they can speak entirely different languages but look at the pictures and still understand what's going on. Today, the market for that is bigger than it's ever been. Which gives us a chance to go back and do the comic books on our own terms, which is the wonderful thing about comics. I'm the writer, I'm the director, I'm the camera person, I'm the costume designer, I'm the set designer. I mean, the entire thing. And it's my vision or nothing. And that's great for a control freak like me.